take me back to May of 2015 when you met uh, the Sangbeal family and we just talk about the beginnings of that case and your part in that. I didn't meet the family exactly on May 25th. I met them that following weekend as they do not reside in the city of Saskatoon, but um, their grandson was playing in a soccer tournament. So I went and met them on a Sunday at the soccer center. So I actually got to go and spend time with the family at a family function. That's the first time I had um, had held Cadence. And when I held her, she went stiff, like completely stiff. So I gave her the nickname Starfish. And that's all she's ever been to me is my little starfish. Kasten is a combination of um, Candace's and her biological father, Dustin's name. So it was unique to her. I was blessed and lucky enough to watch her grow from a little child, little baby, to a little person now. Uh, take me back a little bit into your, your job as missing person liaison. Not every police service has one, so talk about how your job is unique uh, to MPS. Um, as a missing persons liaison, my job is to offer and support hope with our families of the missing. So when we talk about supporting hope, People are always asking, what do you mean to support hope? A gentle hug, a kind word, taking part in the vigils, the marches, just being there for the family at that moment in time, throughout this whole moment in time. I've been with the single family now almost four years. Um, I take part in family functions when I'm asked to. Uh, they come down travel to see me just so we can sit and meet because I try to meet our families when they do live in the city of Saskatoon weekly and if I can't meet them weekly I try to maintain contact with them via telephone texting uh, because having a link between the families and the police department is very important in regards to exchanging information if there's concerns or something's come up right. um, <clears throat> talk about the less personal side of your job and just because a lot of people when they they have a, a victim in their life or a missing person in their life. They don't know to go to those services and resources. So talk about that side of it and the process of, and connecting them with all those resources. <clears throat> so when I receive a new missing persons file, I read the report. I go through the report. I see who all is involved in the report. Maybe mom, dad, grandma, auntie, whoever it may be. Mm -hmm. Contact the family. Explain who I am and explain what I do. Um, a lot of our families, at that time when somebody goes missing, they need support. So my job is to connect them with the appropriate supports in the city of Saskatoon. And if they don't live in the city, to try and locate those resources, say they live in Rostern. I would look into Rostern. Um, to connect them with a therapist, an ambiguous loss trained therapist. And when we're talking ambiguous loss, uh, the families have no clear end Hence why the therapy is a little bit different. Right. Um, how did this case kind of stand out for you? I'm sure every missing person case it's, is unique. Yes. Yeah. How is this one unique? When I received Candace's file, I had to go through it. And it was difficult for me because it's always difficult when I'm reading the files to try to understand how somebody can simply just disappear. Um, seeing her riding her bike on video that first year, and seeing it over and over and over um, struck me. It affected me because I knew I've probably seen her somewhere here in the city of Saskatoon. So that first year, I would walk Saskatoon. I would literally post her everywhere that I could post her because since the family doesn't live in the city, I took it upon myself to try and keep her name, her photo, and everything out there simply for that family because this is the first time I've had a family that did not live in the same city that's where somebody went missing, so I knew it had to be a little different this time. So you kind of have to be that local voice for Candace. The local voice, but I always ask permission. I always have to ask permission from the family if that's something that they're willing to do or they want me to do. Um, and since they don't live here, I remember when they phoned me and told me they were going to dedicate a tree for Candace and that they were putting it in front of a, a shelter. 
right, to support hope for those women that are, that are in that shelter because they understand now that when you're living in a situation where you're vulnerable, <laughs> that you run the risk of going missing. And that's something that a family should never have to develop an understanding of that, especially a parent, a loved one that's left behind. And I'm going to get the family to talk about this too, but can you describe from the family telling you um, how uh, Candace's life kind of progressed? It was difficult when you sit with a parent and they always talk about the shoulda, coulda, woulda. Because when we're already talking shoulda, coulda, woulda, it's something has already occurred. Pauline and Greg knew their daughter had addictions, knew that their daughter was living below the poverty level, and they have tried to support her in the past to assist her. And then you hear things like, oh, they need a little tough love. Oh, they need this. They need that. So watching them lose their daughter to addictions or watching their daughter not being able to eat that day was very difficult for them, as it would be difficult for any parent. And then not living here in the city and not knowing where she was and not receiving those weekly or daily phone calls always causes concern. But when you're dealing with addictions, the concern is a little deeper because A, you're always worried, well, what if they OD? Um, B, what if they're out somewhere and they freeze to death? C, what if they wander away or fall in the river? Or the scenario is, is a little different when you're dealing with addictions. So I know as parents that they struggled with that. What stood out for you dealing with with Candace in this in this situation where she's got that loving family of support system that's there for her and then she still went missing? The thing that stands out for me in regards to Candace K. Singbell is she's got two little people, two loving little people. And as a mother and as any mother, we would do anything in our power to reunite with those little people. And as I watch them grow and spend quality time with them to see them grow and see those little personalities develop, I know that those children are hurting for their mom. And they're, they're very blessed that they have Pauline and Greg to raise them. They're very blessed. They weren't put lost in the system. When I think of Candace K. Singbell, and I see those two beautiful little gifts that she left here, well, she didn't leave them, but her parents are raising them. And I, and I watch them grow. I've been watching those little ones grow for four years. And I see the personality, you know, and my little starfish man, she's spirited, hey? She's spirited. Oh, my. Some people would call her a little hellion, but I call her spirited, right? So when I think of her, and Pauline says, that's how Kay was. That's how Candace was. She was spirited, hey? I'm like, oh, my. <laughs> and when I look at Nathan... And I see the wonderful man, young man, that he's growing in, growing into becoming. And to think of the loss, the heartache that he has, that starfish has waiting, right? Waiting for their mom to come home. Waiting for news of their mom. And I think this is four years of these little people's lives, not being able to wrap their arms around their mother or not to say, I love you, Mom. You know, I'm so grateful that, I, that you're here, Mom. Things kids say to their parents. Mother's Day. You think of Mother's Day. And I know it must affect them because Pauline is their grandma and Nathan's aware of that. Uh, starfish, uh, I think that she thinks Pauline is her mom, which is okay. But for Nathan, when you make a Mother's Day card at school, right, every child is so happy to make that card. And for Nathan, he makes it for Pauline. 
and that's okay. But his little heart, I know, must be hurting for his mom. Because he had memories. Of her. He has memories. He has. He kept. Fo- he has photos of her in his room. Every Christmas, they buy a new angel for Kay, and they hang it on the tree for her, waiting for her to come home. Right? It's those unopened Christmas presents. It's those unopened Mother's Day cards. It's those unopened birthday cards, birthday presents that they buy for their mom because they're still waiting. They're gonna, they're still waiting. Four years is a long time in a little person's life. Things change dramatically in a little person's life in four years. Going into ambiguous loss, can you describe what it is and how it affects this family? Ambiguous loss, there is a huge definition if you Google it or look it up in the dictionary. But for myself, when we talk about ambiguous loss, I want, it, I want people to think of it as a big piece of your heart and your spirit, your soul, missing. And you're walking around every day, every single moment of the day with this unknown hurt. And that unknown hurt is going to remain there if there's no answers. No, the questions you ask all the time, there's no answers. Where could they be? How could they be? And you walk around like that every day, that longing, that waiting, that suffering, that hurting. I mean, we all go through grief as we get older in life. And at least grief has some closure. But when we're talking about a missing loved one, there is no closure until we have the answers. And even then, if we have some answers, there's still the other ones that we want to know. So to describe how, or are they dealing with ambiguous loss? How is the St. Bill family dealing with ambiguous loss? Um, we're very lucky to have a trained ambiguous loss therapist, Otter Regina. Um, I know I've made referrals for them, and they have seen an ambiguous loss therapist. I know Nathan is seeing a child, a child therapist, right? But I think um, with that family, just embracing the love that they have for each other and sharing that strength and that energy that they have for each other, and having that open discussion and allowing people to be angry or sad or having a really good memory and be happy about that. Um, when a person is missing for a long time, a lot of mainstream people don't know how to react. And they always want to say, oh, I'm so sorry that they're still missing. Or they choose not to discuss it anymore or they choose to pretend it's not happening anymore. And when they see the family, they don't want to, they don't know how to react. So a lot of times people just walk away or say, oh, good day, and walk away. With the Singbell family, having Candace gone missing, they've always, it's there at the forefront every day, like with many of the other families that I work with. It's just that we, need to start educating mainstream society how these families are suffering for long periods of time, right? And I'm talking five years, 10 years, 15 years, six months. Mm -hmm. That, That hurt and that longing is still there, right? And we have to be able to openly discuss it so that the family feels supported. How has your relationship changed with the family going from 2015, where we've got a missing person four years later, where a lot of people start losing hope after time. Mm-hmm. So how how has the case changed, and how has your relationship changed? My relationship with the family is I'm part of their family. I'm not going anywhere. If I ever left the police department, I would still be part of their family. Um, I promise that I would be there to walk through this journey with them, however long that journey takes. Um, Me and Pauline refer to each other as sisters. Um, I get my my cards, my pictures of the kids, pictures of the wedding, um, all those wonderful things, just as a family. When I first started, 
as with every family, it's a little awkward, right, to have this stranger walk in and say, hi, my name is blah, 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 and I'm here to support you. And then we do all the toolkit. Um, let's do a missing persons checklist. When was the last time you seen them? Um, what needs to be done in the first 24 hours, 24 hours, 48 hours, 36 hours, six months, that year anniversary? And the families are like, well, what can we do? Well, let's do a candlelight vigil. Well, I don't know how to set one up, but I do, and I'll help you, and I'll assist you. You know, that first year, I remember hanging posters all throughout the city of Saskatoon. And the day we had our march, it was raining. And I'm like, oh, my God, it's raining. Nobody had umbrellas, right? So we put a call out, we put a call out to the community to bring umbrellas, and they did, right? I'm like, nice, nice. And we all walked together. We put a call out to our other families that I work with, and they all came to support each other. Four years later, we're still waiting. I'm still waiting. If the family says, Dorothea, can you come and see me? I'm like, okay, I'll come out, have a hug. We'll have coffee, celebrate her birthday, celebrate Christmas, Valentine's Day, right? Does the support you give that family change as time goes on and some people might lose hope or begin to lose hope? I hope that they never lose hope. There's different stages in a missing person's file. Sometimes the family's been waiting 15 years and they want to declare them deceased. And then they'll ask me not to contact them weekly, monthly, whatever it is, yearly, anniversary dates. And I'm fine. But they'll ask me to call once a year or to call when, if there's any new information. And I'm okay with that. Just depending on the circumstances and what the family wants, what the family needs, that's what I'm here to provide. If they don't want me to come visit as much, I'll step back. One of the unique presents that they gave me uh, two years into it was um, a set of hands holding a little heart. And it sits at in my, my mantle at home, this little heart. And when I got it, they said, thank you for all you do. You're the keeper of our, our hearts. You're helping us keep our hearts safe. So every, every day I reach out and I touch that little pink heart, right? And then on our third year, they sent me an angel, right, to hang on my Christmas tree as part of the family. So things change. I'm here as long as they need me. I'm here as long as they need to support hope. Sometimes supporting hope is just a simple hug. Sometimes they're mad too and they want to swear, and it's like, go ahead, swear. I know you're not swearing at me. I know you're swearing out of frustration, and that's fine. We'll work through it. If you could speak to someone who knows what happened to Candace, on behalf of the family, what would you say? And working with them, what would you say to them? I'd ask them, please, come forward. This beautiful woman has people waiting, and they've been waiting a long time. Her children, her sisters, and her parents need to know any information you have that can help us bring her home, help us reunite her with her children, whatever that may look like. Please come forward. I think our family has waited long enough. They suffered long enough. They've hung enough angels on that tree. So please come forward. If you don't want to phone Crime Stoppers or whoever you need to phone, come on in for a visit. Come have coffee. Come sit with me if you'd like. And we can work through it together. That's what we're here for. Um, going back to the first time you kind of dove into the case and looked at the security footage of Candace riding her bike. Mm -hmm. And that is the one video that's in the media the most. Mm -hmm. um, Again, what was unique to you about this case and about Candace? What just didn't add up in your mind? She disappeared. She was running, she's riding her bike down third. The sun is shining. It's a, it's a beautiful day. And we see her riding her bike, and then all of a sudden she just disappeared. And I'm thinking, how is that humanly possible? In today's day and age, with video footage, with people always around downtown, 
that this beautiful woman just disappeared. Somebody must know something. Somebody must have seen something because she just literally vanished. Off the streets of Saskatoon, vanished. So it kind of made me think a little harder. Somebody's got to know. How does somebody do that? Just disappear. Out of a video, out of a shot on a video, you see her riding her bike, she turns the corner, and then that's the last time anybody's seen her. So it's kind of haunting to me, right? So you think you believe someone knows something? I, somebody has to know something, right? And I mean, if somebody does know something, come share, come tell us. Because it's not just a crime or affecting one person. There's much more behind that person. With every missing person, there's a minimum of 12 people that are affected. And we chose 12 because it's average family. But it goes larger than 12 per missing person. You have the family. You have the aunties, the uncles, the cousins. You have the community. You have the organizations that that person belonged to. You have kinship with people that you call sister out of just kindness and love. So it's not only 12. We just chose that number. So you have all of Candace's hometown right at this moment, wondering where she is, waiting for her, still trying to love her, support her, bring her home, right? even though she experienced violence. She did what was best for her kids, for her children, and asked her parents to look after them until she could. And that's what I mean when I say Pauline and Greg have done everything they can in their power to support her, to love her, mm -hmm. including raising her children. That's not an easy task to take on when you get a little older. I mean, we're supposed to be able to be grandparents and feed them sugar and whatever you want to feed them. But we shouldn't have to discipline them. We should be, yay, it's fun time with grandma and grandpa. Not, you got to go to your room because you're not listening to grandma and grandpa. That's a big sacrifice. That's a sacrifice of love. And that's what they've done. Made a big sacrifice of love when she asked for help. And even though she was in a bad place in her life, she was smart enough to know she couldn't care for those kids at that time. At that moment in time, she was not strong enough to look after her babies. And she knew her parents loved her, supported her, and honored her. So out of that support, love, and honor, her parents said, OK, we will, we will raise those children until you're capable. And they're still raising them until she's capable. When you sit and talk with the family these days, four years later, do you talk about where you think Candace might be, where they think she might be, or what? where's the conversation when someone's gone missing that long? We talk about what ifs, where she could be, where can we look, how can we bring her story back to the forefront in the media, because we never want them forgotten. There's all those scenarios that people run through their mind, right? Like, what if she was stolen and sold? Or what if she's being held in the basement? Or because we have, we have seen cases like that. And it's like, well, where can we look? What can we do? How can we, how can we find her? Um, those conversations are a little difficult. Sometimes they talk about death and what is going to bringing them home going to look like if she is deceased and how they just want her to come home. You know, but even with the death talk that we do sometimes, there's no 100% answer to tell me that she's deceased. So who am I to say she's deceased, right? Who is anybody to say, oh, they're probably deceased? Unless you can show me, prove to me that she's deceased, then those words will never come out of my mouth. We'll just say, we just got to keep looking. We just got to have support. We just want her to come home. Whatever that may look like, as long as we can bring her home. It's got to be emotionally draining on the family. 
and physically probably. Oh yes. We've talked about self-care, what to do, counseling, exercising, proper eating, sleeping. Sleeping is difficult because when you have, your mind is racing. And if your mind is racing, how are you supposed to sleep, right? If you're a smoker and you're under stress, what do you do? You smoke more. If you're a drinker, you're under stress, what do you do? You drink more. Um, you don't eat. You don't sleep. That's probably difficult to understand. When you have a long-term missing person, you just don't get to go back to work six months later, right? But sometimes you have to force yourself to go back to work because what are you going to do? Where's the money going to come from, right? To hold a vigil, to hold anything, that money to do those functions, Come out, of the, come out of donations, fundraising for or from the family's bank account. Life changing. Yeah, it's life. It's, that's something I, I pray to the Lord, Creator, Buddha, Allah, whoever is listening, that I don't have to walk that journey in my own life. I've watched and I've taken part and I feel the heartache that our families go through, are still going through. And to watch the, our little people and to watch the parents suffer daily and put on that, oh, hi, how are you? When you know inside there's a piece of them that's dying daily, right? It hurts. I hurt for them. I hurt with them. 